I'm now going to uh, make a few words of introduction about uh, this panel discussion and then invite the panelists to come up and I think we're, we're in for a really meaningful conversation. The real force of human rights over the past century has been the moral force, the power of people self-organizing around an unequivocal statement of human values. Of course legal rights matter, of course policies matter, but the most transformational change has happened through the power of movements. It's in people uniting and raising consciousness. It's when people can clearly declare, this is what we value. Apartheid in South Africa didn't end because of the text of an international law. It didn't end because of an official threat to send the culpable government officials to the International Criminal Court in The Hague. Rather, it ended because people in South Africa and around the world could recognize clear violations of their rights and organically divestment and organize divestment campaigns, protests, boycotts, media exposure and lobbying at multiple levels of government to drive the application of diplomatic and economic pressure. It was a movement. Movements change history. And here's the thing. Movements also transform us personally. Participation in a just movement is one of the clearest pathways to the experience of belonging. I've seen this happen with people I love across sectors and circumstances. I've come to experience so much belonging through this movement that has brought us together in this symposium. This is the work going forward. The work is to build and sustain a movement to restore connection and rootedness to people, place, power, and purpose. With that context setting, I now want to invite the panelists to come up. My first panelist is Kenneth Deer, Secretary of the Mohawk Nation at Gananoque and Director of Indigenous World Association. Kenneth. You have been at the forefront of movements in your community and on the world stage. How have you seen movements restore belonging for your community or for the communities you have served? And how has your participation in these movements changed you? Wow. I only have 10 minutes? <laughs> uh, well, thank you, Kim. Also, thank you for um, inviting me to this conference. It's a wonderful conference. I met so many wonderful people here. I'm very honored uh, uh, to be here to, uh, to, to speak with you. Um, I, I, I want to focus, um, you know, as an indigenous person, uh, we, a lot of um, as discussion has focused on indigenous people in, uh, in the last three days. The, and you know that indigenous people, we have a very unique situation, I guess, because uh, as indigenous people, we, we've been uh, dispossessed, uh, disempowered, uh, victims of, of genocide, and, um, and so we have a, a, a worldwide struggle uh, to be recognized even as simply as being peoples or, or, or per persons or people who are equal to, to, to others. So um, at the international level, uh, which I've been very, very in involved in, um, we, uh, uh, people talk about the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. That did not happen overnight. As a matter of fact, there are many, many people who said that the, the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People will never see the light of day. And that, uh, and that you know, we, it, would, it would never happen. States would never recognize indigenous peoples as peoples. But as, as, uh, but as we gathered in, in, in Geneva, uh, we had indigenous people from around the world, from uh, North America, Latin America, Africa, Asia, Siberia. And we had something in common, even though we had different languages, come from different uh, regions, different life experiences, we all had something very much in common. And that is the dispossession, the disempowerment, you know, the victims of, of, of genocide and oppression. And that's what held us together. That's what made us, uh, gave us so much strength and, and solidarity, even though we spoke different languages. And, uh, and even languages uh, uh, wasn't even that much of a barrier. 
Because once we, uh, one of the problems we had was communication, talking with each other, particularly those from the north and those from the south. We speak English, they, speak, they spoke Spanish in the early days of the negotiations and the discussions. And uh, we would meet together in a room like this and we'd, we'd uh, discover, uh, come to strategies. We'd come to uh, one mind before we went into the room and to meet with states. But as time went on, we found out the English speaking indigenous people are going this way and the Spanish speaking people are going that way. And uh, I was chairing the meeting and I couldn't understand what was going, what, what was going wrong. The indigenous uh, Spanish speaking were wondering, were being, they're being betrayed by the, uh, by the English speaking uh, indigenous people, English speaking people felt they were being uh, misunderstood by the, uh, by the Spanish. And then we found out the problem was interpretation that the, the people that were interpreting for us weren't skilled. We, 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 because we had no money, we were uh, using volunteer interpreters. People with good hearts, fine people, lovely people, generous people, but they did not understand the, the, the nuances of international law and, and uh, I guess, uh, or a uh, worldview of, of indigenous people. So they would inter interpret our words quite loosely. And then that's why there was this mis uh, uh, mis uh, you know, misinterpretation. And uh, that's why we end up going in different directions. So the European uh, support groups who were helping us realize, recognize this, and they raised money, and then they got us professional interpreters. And once we got professional interpreters, then that seemed to solve the issue. Then indigenous peoples were speaking different languages, English, Spanish, French, and Russian for the, our indigenous brothers and, and sisters in, in, in Siberia. And once we could start, start to communicate at a, at a, at a, at a level where we, where all the languages understood what, what, uh, what, we're, what we're trying to do, and then it went a, a lot more smoothly. Not that we were always agreeing, but because we all had that same experience of being oppressed and being dispossessed, we had a tremendous amount of solidarity. And that solidarity is what carried indigenous people uh, uh, through the United Nations. It took us 25 years, 25 years uh, to get the, the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People through the UN. That is the longest um, time it's taken to take any kind of uh, convention uh, or declaration through the United Nations. There's no other one that, that took so long, but it took us 25 years. And, but it was a sense of solidarity uh, and also strategy, working together uh, to, to get that declaration through, to convince states that we are, yes, we are peoples, and we are peoples equal to all other peoples, and therefore we have a right to self-determination. That was the fundamental battle that we had with states. And we still, even today, even though we have we won the declaration, uh, there are still states today who would have very, who will, not, will prefer not to call us peoples. Because if you call us, because once we're called peoples and we have a right to self-determination, we still have that, that, that battle today. But in a sense of belonging, I think that's that, the, what we call the Indigenous Caucus was, was a place where Indigenous peoples, even though from, no matter what part of the world that they belonged to, they felt welcome in that room. And they, they met people with similar situations. And we were able to, to, to build a strategy and build a movement, a, what I call the International Indigenous Movement, to come together to accomplish what, what, what we did. And it was so successful that uh, other movements have studied the Indigenous Caucus and studied how the declaration was was gotten through and other movements are copying how, how indigenous peoples uh, organized themselves and were able to, to uh, accomplish uh, uh, something that states did not want to have. So uh, has it affected me? Absolutely. Um, uh, I, was, um, I coordinated those, those caucus meetings. I had to um, you know, uh, uh, also chair many, many of those meetings and it gave me a whole broader view of indigenous. I, I wasn't, I'm a Mohawk. I'm part of the uh, Haudenosaunee, which is made up of six nations, Mohawks, Oneidas, Onondaga, Cayuga, Seneca, and Tuscarora. But I got to see the world in a whole different way. I got to see how other people function, how the, how the Mapuche fu uh, function, and, 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 and how, the, how the Mayas, and, and how the uh, people in Siberia, how the, how the, uh, how the um, uh, Sami in, the, in, in, uh, in Scandinavia, how they organize and how they think. We don't always think the same but we have a lot of commonalities and, and I can appreciate the differences of other peoples and still be, I can, I can call myself a Mohawk and a, and a, and a citizen of Haudenosaunee and, and, and be indigenous as well. 
and, uh, and, and I think it changed the way my, my worldview a lot. Uh, I'm, I'm a little less, um, what would you call it, nationalistic? Uh, of course, I'm very nationalistic. You should have seen me before. Um, but, I, but I understand and more have a respect for, for, uh, for, uh, for other indigenous people. At the same time, our, the opposite side, uh, states and, and, and your, your representatives, uh, you know, the, the representatives that, that, that you elect, you know, I, I had to learn how to work and deal with them because we always, didn't, for sure, we didn't see, this, see uh, eye to eye, but also had to learn to respect other people's point of view, the people that you belong to and, and your representatives and how I can relate, how can we uh, educate them about us. And, and I think that was an accomplishment that how we educated states that yes, we're peoples and yes, we have a right to self-determination was a tremendous uh, uh, part of, of, the, uh, of, uh, the, ener of the energy or the, the objective of indigenous peoples in this whole process. So it's a, yes, it's a sense of belonging and uh, at the same time, respecting others' right to belong to whatever society they, they, they belong to. And yes, we can all coexist uh, 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 together. Thank you. Thank you very much. You can keep that. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to uh, ask a, a question or two of each panelist, and then we'll uh, open this to discussion. Peggy, uh, you're next. Peggy Delaney, chair, founder and chair of Sinergos Institute. You've been a global leader in arts, health, and eradicating poverty. How have you seen global movements build belonging with a particular focus on uh, the role of inner work and the role of social connectedness and how, how it fits in? Thank you, Kim. And before I tell okay. the story that I hope will illustrate what I want to say, what I want to say about you is that for years you've called me um, your mentor, but I think I'm becoming your mentee. Ah. <laughs> um, congratulations. So the story I want to tell is one that I hope exemplifies both the importance of doing the inner work, but the connectedness of that to then manifesting in the outside world in a way that can go to scale. And the story is of a man who's now, I would say, middle-aged, but who grew up under the apartheid regime, um, as with most black South Africans, um, with a single mother in living in poverty and feeling isolated. So he had overcome so many things by the time I had a chance to meet him. He was leading an organization, externally very powerful, good speaker, had retained his humility. Um, and he came to a retreat that we held. We do these personal reflection retreats every year. And in the course of that, um, he kind of sank down. We almost call it dream time. He's, we, we peel away the layers of the ego and give people a chance, among other things, spending time alone in the wilderness to really reflect on what is their soul's purpose in being on this earth. And in the course of that, he, he um, encountered some very sad and difficult memories that because of his activism and his commitment, he hadn't had a chance really to reflect on. That included that his mother, who had had to work so hard just for the survival of the children and who'd suffered a lot of trauma herself, had really not been able to show the kind of love that all children need and that he, as a result of that, felt that he wasn't sufficiently loving of his wife or his two daughters. So this generated a lot of sadness, but also a continuing process of reflection that he really hadn't allowed himself in all the years of activism. So fast forward, and actually this was happening in a way simultaneously with this retreat, he was really committed to education and to offering education opportunities for all South African children. So he began to focus on one state, one province, uh, which was a province where the government agreed to co-fund an initiative to try to improve um, the performance of students. That was the ultimate goal. But he began to realize that the parents the students, the teachers, the principals, the community leaders, 
to some extent, we're also suffering from these symptoms of trauma, a sense of isolation. And so among the many other things that they did to create a stronger sense of community, he decided that the teachers really needed to be honored with some personal space. And so he organized retreats in all of the parts of the province where they worked for the teachers. They weren't week-long retreats. Um, they didn't have an opportunity to do solo work. But it was an opportunity to have a nice couple of meals and to talk with each other in a different way than they would ordinarily in the classroom. Fast forward, this province, which had had either the worst or the second worst performance in education in the country, in one and a half years went to the first. It was an amazing achievement. And they did an evaluation. And the thing that came out on top of everything was the teachers' retreats. That having had that opportunity to sit among themselves, to feel valued, to be offered this opportunity, changed their whole perception of themselves and their roles. So I use this example as a way in which doing our own personal work, going to those really difficult places of trauma, um, hopefully in a safe space that then creates the possibility of becoming vulnerable and more authentic, taking off our masks, and then creating a sense of belonging as the teachers did in their retreat, opens in each of us the possibility of, as somebody in yesterday's um, a group on strategic storytelling mentioned, so that they could be their best, and they could feel the best in themselves. And then the next piece is recognizing what are the obstacles then that exist within me? Why am I not able to be my best more often? And in the context of a safe space and a safe group, really having the chance to explore that, to try out our best, to also be vulnerable to what our weak points are. And that, in what I've been noticing over the retreats that we've been holding for a very long time, I think it's um, 15 or 16 years, has led to the possibility of most of the people who went through them, first of all, coming away with a sense of belonging, then becoming less judgmental of themselves and of other people, and therefore opening up to curiosity and once you're open to curiosity, then you can free the imagination, you can free your creativity. Many people who are activists like ourselves just burn ourselves out. We don't have the energy anymore. And so once we regain that sense of awe and beauty and the capacity for creativity, it enables us to get into a state of flow in which we just, we know, we, doesn't, we don't have to plan what we're gonna say, we know what the next thing is. And the next phase after that that I've found, and by the way, there's always regressions, which I'll get to in a minute, but the next phase is where one retains humility, feels a genuine sense of compassion, is connected to others and maybe to a larger whole, which amplifies the sense of belonging, feels a sense of love. And the output for virtually everyone who goes through these retreats these opportunities for self-reflection is the desire to serve with love. And that is, I believe, what will create the possibility for us to develop movements in which we build trust, which for us is a fundamental thing that is being torn apart in our respective societies, to build the trust, to trust ourselves, to feel a sense of belonging, to be able to be in flow, to connect to others, and to serve with love. The, uh, the phrase, the desire to serve with love, is so beautiful because we think a lot about serving and serv service, but the underlying emotion for, for things to really manifest, it's not duty, it's, it's love. Thank you very much, Peggy. I'm now going to stay at this end of the, uh, of the panel and, and move to Musimbi. Musimbi Canyoro, former CEO, Global Fund for Women, and currently doing just about everything else <laughs> for the rights of women and, uh, and furthering uh, education. 
And uh, really, it's wonderful to have you here with us. Ms. Simbi comes from Kenya. You have personally been a leader in liberation movements as an activist, advocate, and scholar. You have been the head of a leading global service and grant-making institution, a catalyst for contemporary global movements for women and girls. What inspires you about the work of movement building? What's the transformation you've seen in your work and in your life? Thank you, Kim. And thank you, uh, sisters and brothers and everyone who is in here. Um, I met Kim at Sinagos, so it's really interesting how the world goes round. The question about what inspires me for transformation, I can probably sum it up in saying, throughout my professional life, I have been an activist, and I have been an activist because I saw my own parents as activists uh, during the time that we were growing up. I had parents who were in the medical field and they were really concerned about the welfare of everybody and especially looking at the issues of health within rural areas. And not only did, were they prepared to provide the services for which they were trained, but actually speaking up and making sure that they are doing advocacy that brings access to the people that they were concerned about. So I saw it at home. And I think that that has continued to inspire me. But most important is that my professional, throughout my professional life, I have traveled and worked specifically with women and girls in many countries. I currently live in San Francisco, and students at Stanford who wanted to learn a bit about my life did, um, 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 took my 27 passports and they did a mapping for me, which shows that I have been in 137 countries, and some, like India, been there 27 times. So some many times, but 137 countries. If you ask me about these countries, and people often ask, where do you want to live? Which country did you like most? I don't remember these countries by the countries. Rather, I remember by the people that I met and worked with in those countries. And given that I've always worked with people who are trying to transform their communities, who know what needs to change, who come rain, come snow, are going to be out there trying to make that change. They inspire me. And they are the ones that have kept me going from day to day and feeling at home in every geography, in every community, and have taught me that movements actually make the greatest change. And movements make the greatest change because they help people know that when we hold together, we can do more than any individual can do. There's an Ethiopian proverb that says, when spiders make their webs, they can be able to tie a lion. A spider and a lion have quite some difference in the sizes of each one of them. But I believe that movements have inspired me because I have seen how change comes from different movements. Not only one movement, women's human rights is one movement, but to succeed, the need for collaborating with all other movements movements of um, children, movements of LGBTQ, movements of environments is really vital. And where I have been inspired is when I have seen what change looks like when it is done through movements. First, you see a shift in people's mind. They begin to say, to really reframe what it is that they believed before and see it different. And then you see that they are not afraid to share the change that they are experiencing. I'll give you an example. We all know domestic violence, and for years and end, in every country, every law would say, this is domestic, you can't bring it to the public. And every woman or person who experienced any domestic violence thought that they were crazy by themselves. 
And then this became political. It became bigger. People began to, to hear it from others through movements. And people began to know they're not crazy. It's something terrible that is happening to them. And they began to reframe it. It's not about me being crazy. It's about something wrong happening to me. And I need to be able to speak about it, to do something about it, and to let someone else know that this is not right to happen. And today, there is no part of the world where you will not hear about gender-based violence being spoken out in public, in the villages, in parliaments, at the United Nations, etc. There is a shift, a big shift that happened, and a shift that now will uh, uh, affect policies. It brings in different types of resources, and people can be involved in many ways. So these are ways, there are many, many different ways that I've been inspired, but I've been inspired by those on whose shoulders we continue to stand because they have been there active, doing something that brings changes in people's lives. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Cindy, I was re really uh, struck with the, the phrase you, you used, at what makes you feel at home, and what makes you feel at home in the many, many, many countries you've been to many, many times is that connection with, with people and with their stories. And, and that, that to me is at, at the heart of what, what belonging feels like. Do you feel at home everywhere? I feel like I can make home everywhere, yeah. even sometimes when I'm not at home in that place. Yeah. And the difference is that when I know that I am not at home, and I feel like I need to be at home in that place. I have lived long enough with people who are doing something about it that I, I have the possibility of the agency to try and look for the help that I need or speak up when I need to speak up. And I do tell you that um, what we say in our words as human persons and what we actually experience and live is not, don't always go together. You, I have been in places where the word inclusive, collaboration, uh, having everybody treated in the same way, I really like say it very loudly. But I sit and come in the place, and suddenly I'm the black, I'm the woman, I am the one who will be talked down upon, because everybody imagines if you are coming from Africa, you don't have a global view on issues, etc. These kind of things happen. And so I feel like part of my role at this moment, when I don't feel that I belong, but can notice what is going on, I should be part of what helps to create a possibility that extends us, that moves us, that makes us uncomfortably get out of our skin so that someone else does not have to go through it. And the way that I have to do it has to be respectful enough that the conversation can go on. I don't believe in breaking the conversation so that I can get my rights. I do believe that if I have to pursue rights which will impact more than myself, I have to know how to stay in the discussion table. And what our first speaker said was really important to me. When, I, when you can be able to see where is this person coming from? What is their worldview? What are they thinking? And can I be able to expand their knowledge? Can I learn something from them? So that's how, at the moment, I feel like I can't try to belong, even when sometimes I am not naturally welcome yeah. to belong, yeah. or invited to belong, but not actually acknowledged. And the second thing that I wanted to say about this is, in conversations such as we have, we do want everybody to be included, but we must affirm differences as well, and diversities. Because if we say we want to believe in the same thing, 
we will not accommodate difference of opinions, difference of how we have been raised, etc., and seek to do right with those differences. So I do believe in us having human rights for everybody, but actually learning to live with diversities and differences and seeking something that is useful out of those diversities and differences. Thank you. Thank you. I'm now going to move to you, Graham. Graham Reed is the director of the LGBT program at Human Rights Watch. It's great to have you with us. Graham, you've been at the forefront of a modern struggle for human rights and dignity. Have you seen the success of movements in your life and work manifest slowly, quickly, up and down and back and forth. I'm thinking of a couple of stories that you've told me. How does progress get made? And how has participation in this movement impacted you personally? Thanks, Kim. Um, I'm going to start with the second part of okay. your question. It's to how did this impact me personally and how did I become involved? And I want to pick up on a point that you made at the beginning about the anti-apartheid struggle and the movement that led to the demise of apartheid. I am South African and I grew up during that period, so I'm dating myself, but um, something unique in South Africa was that the anti-apartheid struggle also embraced LGBT rights. And South Africa became the first country in the world, in fact, to include sexual orientation as an expressed ground of protection in its constitution. And there was a very significant leader in South Africa by the name of Simon and Cordy, who was charged with treason because of his anti-apartheid activities, and who also happened to be gay and a prominent gay activist. And he always said, I cannot separate my struggle as a black man from my struggle as a gay man. And that's something that's been profoundly influential for me is the, uh, the ways in which these struggles are inseparable. And so that's why um, human rights, working at Human Rights Watch as part of the LGBT program that integrates human rights and doesn't work in isolation but rather addresses human rights writ large has been something that guides my work internationally. But I feel that the source of that was from the perspective of my South African experience. To answer the bigger question, I think there's been dramatic progress on LGBT rights internationally. And as we face the real concrete struggles of today, the kinds of situation that we see in Uganda just last week with 16 activists being arrested, the kinds of situation that we're seeing increasingly in the US where there's in, uh, systematic attacks on transgender people, for example, or the horrific roundup and abuse of gay men in Chechnya that um, we as Human Rights Watch documented some two years ago and that had a resurgence again this year. It's important to look, I think, in the long term and the long um, trajectory to see and remind ourselves of the dramatic progress that has been made over a long period of time. Fifteen years ago, and that's not a long time ago, Human Rights Watch became the first mainstream human rights organization to include an LGBT rights program. In 2001, the Netherlands seemed an absolute outlier by including same-sex marriage. Now some 28 countries around the world allow for same-sex marriage. When I started eight years ago in my current role, there were 76 countries that outlawed same-sex relations. Now that's down to 69. That's still 69 countries is a lot, but it's important to consider and to remember that progress. Now how does this change come about? I want to illustrate it by talking a little bit about a project in the Middle East North Africa region. There we partnered with an organization called the Arab Foundation for Freedom and Equality and asked them what kind of assistance, what kind of solidarity, what kind of support could Human Rights Watch offer that would 
assist them in their struggles. And they came up with something quite unusual, is that they said the real issue for them is the deep sense of isolation. It's so often the case that individuals say, am I the only one? And because LGBTQ issues are so often hidden, stigmatized, not spoken about, is that people feel deeply isolated. And they asked us to partner in a very simple premise which was about telling individual stories, putting those on video, and aiming those not at government and policymakers, but aiming at those, at those individuals who felt deeply isolated um, within their families, at school, within their communities, to send a message and to send an image of somebody who they could recognize that had survived and had thrived. So that it was some sense of conveying a possible role model to people who are feeling desperately isolated and alone. And that video was shared some four million times the last time we looked. It's a very simple message of people throughout the Middle East and North Africa region, from Libya, from Egypt, from Lebanon, just talking about their personal experiences the difficulties that they'd faced, but also a hopeful message that conveyed in a very direct way the resilience that they'd experienced and encouraged. And so that is a, a first um, building block at creating a connectedness, a social environment, an ability to connect, and from there to be able to develop a movement with goals that center more on creating uh, and defending the rights of LGBT people internationally. I would say that that's the basis yeah, of our work. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, really important also that you, I love that you shared the example about apartheid and the, and the synergy in terms of a rights movement for LGBT rights, because I think that the, the intersectionality is very important uh, when we, when, we talk, when we talk about belonging, connectedness, shame, stigma, empathy, et cetera, there's many different words to come to the same uh, place. As you know, my involvement with Human Rights Watch uh, is, uh, is centered on, on the rights of people with disabilities and on the rights of older people, where there's huge synergies, but also then if you could look at, uh, if we look at the rights of women, who are older people, or if we if we look at the at the rights of people with disabilities who are refugees, and I, I think that that way of thinking is maybe the right word isn't mm -hmm. systems thinking, maybe it, it's it's more intuitive, but but it's also a really good way to approach systems because otherwise we end up with this over here, over here, over here, and we can be much stronger working on issues. The, that are related to rights and equity and dignity and decency and trust and belonging uh, if, we, if we put them together. Which brings me to Sophie Weldon. Sophie, welcome. Sophie has come all the way from Australia. Uh, Sophie is the founding and managing director of Humankind Enterprises, which I, uh, I, well, when I first met you, I think we both had the same feeling that we didn't really know much about what each other did, but just enough to know that I think I have a sister organization, <laughs> and so we thought so too. And uh, I think we think so even more now. So to be continued, welcome. Sophie, you empower mo movements in your work. You facilitate storytelling and collaboration in order to build a future of belonging. Have you? seen, how have you seen, I should say, the power of movements manifest in your life and career? And how has your personal participation in movements brought positive change to your life? Um, first of all, thank you so much for the contributions. I can see a thread. Um, is this working? All right? Yeah. Okay. Um, I can see, a, a, you know, a beautiful thread through all our work and um, just 
you know, picking up from where you left off about the power of movements being driven by people connecting on shared struggles and, and sharing those stories um, and co-creating that movement, that a movement isn't something that starts in an ad agency and is then you know, thrown out to a community and everyone, you know, real movements start from people sharing their real life stories and, and they co-create that narrative. Um, in our work, we help communities share their stories um, and we collect thousands of stories across communities, but we also build capacity in individuals and organisations to collect their own stories, to drive their own movements and their own change narratives. So we see ourselves as an enabler that works with organisations and systems and government to further the, the changes that need to happen. But we also run our own programs and build social connection. One movement that I'm particularly passionate about is, is um, reducing or, or eliminating ageism because you know, my grandparents raised me and I'm very, very proud of that. And I think ageism is one of the biggest atrocities that we face now because we have elders in our midst that can help us but we're not listening to them. Um, That's you. <laughs> So, I mean, that is one movement that I'm particularly passionate about because of my upbringing and, and values, but it's, it's so intersectional in, in storytelling, as we've seen woven throughout the last three days, is essential for all our movement. And I guess um, I just want to touch on the movement that we're creating and that we're sharing here. Um, all the stories that we've shared in the last few days are, are so powerful. And, and for me, I've been sitting back thinking about how I can drive change when I leave here and further my vision for a future of belonging. And something that's been coming into my head is, um, is this thing that we're working on, which is creating the world's biggest data set on belonging. And when I say data set, I'm talking about data with soul. I'm talking about storytelling. I'm talking about rich narrative, not just numbers. Um, we've been asking people when we go out to do story collections what their definition of belonging is a time they've felt a sense of belonging and a time they haven't, when they've been really disconnected and isolated. And this has highlighted how diverse this term is. Like we've mentioned, diversity, um, sorry, belonging has so many different connotations and, and expressions. And within that data, we've been able to highlight these major themes and also, um, you know, my vision is that if we can work together to form this data set together, we can then form recommendations for these different groups and say, well, belonging means this to you, let's work on that, um, rather than cast a language over everything and try and write the narrative for everyone, put it in their voices and put it in their um, story. So that's what I'm really passionate about and my role, I feel, in this space is to work with all of you and, and help this movement. The stories that you uh, um, have in your midst are so powerful and how can we elevate those to further what you've started, Kim? Thanks, Sophie. We know that. People only remember stories. Mm. Yeah. I wanted to, uh, just, just before I move to Matthew, mm. uh, I wanted to, uh, to just ask you about, uh, about ageism. And I wanted to, I agree with you, I'd like, I'd like to stomp out ageism too. I have a vested interest, but I think, I think I do it anyway. We all have a vested interest. <laughs> if we're lucky, right? Yeah, yeah. If we're lucky enough to get up there, yeah. wherever there is. But I wanted to, to ask you about the, the how. How are you planning to do that? I know the why. Yeah. Um, it's funny because I've got some feedback in the last few days like, what do you actually do? Because <laughs> um, I talk a lot about my why, but maybe not enough about the what. Um, the way that we're doing that is through building face-to-face -face social connection between youth and elders, um, within aged care, but also within communities, um, and encouraging young people to be community connectors and story collectors, so going out into the community and creating reciprocity between um, younger and older, as well as working um, with different organisations that uh, work on this issue as well, including the government and supporting them to use strategic storytelling in their advocacy work on ageism so that we're using stories as a way to change attitudes and behaviours and stereotypes rather than just telling younger people they should care. We found that when younger people participate in our programs, they're more likely to go and talk to an older person on a bench or they're more likely to, but we first have to change the attitudes and the drivers and stories is a way to do that by building and fostering empathy and trust. 
So yeah, working on those core drivers of change rather than necessarily just the, um, yeah. the end goal. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Matthew Williams. <laughs> Matthew is from Langley, British Columbia. Matthew is an amazing athlete, former board member of Special Olympics and disability advocate. And before I go on, and I, I don't think you'll mind me doing this, Matthew's up here, but there is a team. It's Matthew and Crystal, so I just want Crystal to stand and recognize her advocacy and leadership too. And uh, I want uh, afterward to, to uh, point all of you to Crystal's blog, uh, where there's a great deal to learn about social connectedness and belonging too. Uh, Matthew, you've been a personal inspiration to me and, and a really very, very dear friend to me um, and a great support, so thank you for all of that. And a global messenger for the Special Olympics movement. Your job is to spread excitement and energy about a future of connection and inclusion and respect. Tell me uh, how you've seen the Special Olympics movement make change and also how being part of Special Olympics has changed your experience of belonging. Thank you, Kim, and <coughs> excuse me, sorry. And thank you, everyone, uh, for uh, being here and listening to, to me speak about my experiences. Um, one of my favorite quotes um, from Nelson Mandela and one I often say in my speech is he said that sports has the power to change the world and every day around the world Special Olympics does that through sport. Um, one thing I notice is that um, sport is a language everyone speaks. I think sports, food and music. And uh, one thing I notice in games and competitions that I've gone to um, is you don't need to say anything. You put a football or a soccer ball or a basketball and you just play. But the feeling of connection through that and feeling the belonging, feeling part of a team, the friendships, the respect and the acceptance and inclusion and every, all the values that I feel everybody should have in their life, I've learned through sport. And for me, growing up, um, Special Olympics really did change my life. I was born with a disability. And um, for many years growing up, I was ashamed about my disability. Because um, I think when you're young, you want to fit in. And for me, I had a hard time accepting being different. Because I thought being different was negative. I hadn't learned that being different can be a positive. And being different, you can change the world. Um, but I'm thankful that I found Special Olympics because they really changed my mindset. They shown me to be accepting of my disability and that I was different, but being different is not a negative thing. You can create a lot of change in the world. And I think from being involved in Special Olympics, it gave me the opportunity to really overcome not just the limitations that society had put on myself and people with disabilities, but the limitations I had put on myself. And it gave me an opportunity to overcome those limitations. And I really think through being able to tell my story, I really hope to inspire individuals with intellectual disabilities and also people without, and having that opportunity to teach acceptance, respect, and inclusion, which is important for not just people with disabilities, but people without everyone to have that in their life. And I think it's definitely important to teach that to younger people, because I think acceptance, respect, inclusion, all those things, it's something you learn. And if we can teach people to learn acceptance, respect, inclusion, they're not only gonna be learners, they go on to be lifelong teachers of that. And I think if we can create people to be lifelong teachers of respect, acceptance, inclusion, belonging, and connectedness, um, that will take a step to truly change in the world. Thanks, Matthew. I'm about to open this to, to the floor for questions and comments, but I just want to ask you a question first which is you, 
You had mentioned that Special Olympics uh, has made a big difference, that you were lucky to find them. I just want to say they were also lucky to find you. And I also want to ask you if you think that every individual has, has the power to share respect and inclusion, whether it be through sport or any other way, that, that maybe part of it is that we just need to recognize that we all have a gift. Yeah, I think that is very important. I think we all have value in our lives. We all have something to give. We can all contribute uh, to society. And I, I think it's really important, and I heard us talking earlier, but we talk a lot about inclusion, but it's important to be meaningful inclusion. And I think that's one of the ways you do that is having a conversation, recognizing people gift, and how we all have something to contribute. And if we can work together, we can really create a lot of positive change around the world. Yeah. Me too. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I can't see very well in, in darker light, so I need more help than usual to, uh, from my colleagues to uh, thank you, <laughs> to put their hands up way high. And uh, when you have a question, if you wouldn't mind, because others may have the same issue I'm having, if you, if you, uh, if you could uh, just tell us who you are and, uh, and question or comment. And if we, uh, I'm going to extend us an extra five minutes if we need to. But if you could make the question or comment short so that we could get uh, hear from anyone who wants to, to share. Um, I, I, too, am part of a movement that is trying to get rights recognized at the UN for all of us when we are older. And I wondered how you maintained enthusiasm and motivation amongst the people you were campaigning with um, when you faced, you were in a very long-term struggle and when you faced repeated barriers and setbacks over those 25 years. Thank you. Ken. Okay. Um, we we always look at the long game. You know, we, we're not, we don't look at the short, you know, if you're going to work, work at the United, or you're going to try to influence the United Nations, don't think you're going to influence them overnight. That happens very, very rarely. Uh, when it does happen, it's awesome. But uh, we, have, we, we took the long view. And, and when, when it took us 25 years to, to, to get the, the declaration is that we just, first of all, we, we refuse to accept defeat. Uh, we refuse to, uh, uh, to, to let other people tell us what's possible and what's not possible. All right, we we decided to make our own way. We were going to do things the way our way, and we weren't going to listen to the to the naysayers. We uh, also, um, we, when you're trying to, it, if I can use a baseball um, um, analogy, since the World Series is going to a seventh game tonight, um, you you can't always hit a home run. You know, you you got to hit those little singles and doubles to uh, you know to build up. Uh, a, a score, you know, and in the end, you might hit a grand slam, but you you have to win those small little battles. You know, the little battles uh, in the UN is 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 words in a in a resolution, a, a phrase or a sentence that that elevates your your struggle one more step, so that you can have you can fight it for one more year. You can, you know, if, instead of taking a a total defeat, try to get something small so that you can you can you you can advance whatever you gain a little higher the next year or the year after the year after. It's a long struggle. It, it, I, and, I, it's, um, and there's a lot of carnage along the way. We, you know, the, the people that I, I started out with when I started doing this stuff in 87, a lot of them are not there, but some of us are still, still are because we, we lose people uh, along the way because they get frustrated or they, they lose support at home or something else happens. It, it's, it's a long struggle. I, I, and you just, just do not give up. And I also find that um, educating states uh, on, on, on little quiet tables, like the, instead of arguing with states on the, in the rooms of the United Nations, you argue with them in the, in the coffee shops, in the hallways, you know, the lobbying uh, goes a long way to, 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 uh, uh, to advance our whatever, whatever goal you want to get, you know, sometimes the worst thing to do is to argue in the big room. That, that, you know, you, you, you do the, the battle, or you do it at home. But you don't, don't uh, there's a, 
There's many different ways to influence the UN, and you got to use all of them. None of them are, are the only solution. You've got you to use all of them. I hope that helps a little bit. I think one of the biggest issues around LGBT rights has been a, a contest as to do LGBT rights belong within the ambit of human rights at all, or are they relegated to the terrain of tradition, culture, and morality? And so um, engaging with the UN has been a high priority for LGBT movement globally. And one, um, to illustrate this point, the, I would mention that recently an independent expert who focuses on sexual orientation and gender identity was appointed by the UN. But that was highly contested. Never before in the history of the UN has a uh, special, uh, as an independent expert, been so contentious that when it went to UN headquarters in New York, it was fought at every step of the way. And why was it? It was because, practically, an independent expert is able to go around and monitor abuses that take place on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity and report back to the UN. And the reports have been very, very valuable. But most significantly was the symbolic threat that having an independent expert within the UN was seen to represent because it emphatically showed that LGBT rights were intrinsically part of human rights writ large. And so that's why there was such resistance to it and so much emphasis placed on basically making LGBT rights part of the routine bureaucratic work of the UN, um, which, of which the independent expert is part. <laughs> One other thing that we should realize about all of these spaces, uh, multilateral organizations, etc., they are usually people who are in these institutions, either at the tables, at the embassies, at um, the staff level, who represent all of these issues for which we advocate. And this is really important to know because uh, they do some inside listening. They read the manuscripts. They feel it in their own, um, where they're coming from. And sometimes, in addition to lobbying the people outside, they play a very big part because there's no issue of human rights that we bring at the UN level for which they aren't people, even with this, within the system itself, or representing the governments who, belong, who don't belong to that issue. And I have found that useful for all of the years that we've worked with the UN. And then in, in every one of these issues, the activists for the issue are in front, for example, for the indigenous peoples. But by the time you were meeting in Geneva, was at that meeting as well, there are several other people who already believed in, your, in, in you, who are not part of the UN system. And they are influencing their own organizations and their own people. And this is what movements are about. When an issue becomes an issue where many people advocate to in every place, and they may mold it to the understanding of their local place, then it is moving towards somewhere, and the UN can no longer neglect it. So I was wondering like, if you could share with us what aspirations and dreams and hopes do you have for people with disabilities and people with intellectual disabilities going forward um, and their role in the society? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, I think for me the goals is um, really equal opportunities that people without disabilities strive for. Um, I think we all have the rights for you know, to be in a relationship, uh, employment, friendship, um, equal rights, respect, dignity, um, all those things I don't think even people with disabilities desire. They deserve the right to have that opportunity. Um, and I think for myself, I've been really thankful that I have had those opportunities and been surrounded by people that have given me the opportunity. Um, and I think growing up, a lot of times I didn't think I was going to have that opportunity because I never felt I had the right. And um, I think being able to overcome that, I hope I can inspire other individuals with disabilities around the world to really see that 
that is a possibility and um, one I really feel strong about is that I hope people with disabilities can be in relationships because um, for myself um, I really strongly believe that in all our lives we need to find something that every day gives us a sense of happiness and I know every day that I'm with my wife Crystal um, and when we got married I realized that every day she was going to give me a sense of happiness whether my, I had a good day or a bad day I was always going to have something that provides me happiness so that's something that I really just uh, really aspire to hopefully provide and encourage individuals with disabilities is that whatever it might be, they find happiness that every day in their life. We need a, mi a microphone here for Ben. And if you could introduce yourself again, Ben. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name's Ben Hack. Um, this has been a really good conference. Um, I think one of the big things that um, I think probably we're probably all suffering from is a, the idea of demonization. Um, I think uh, a lot of the conversations that are happening around the world are creating this problem. I know, um, you know, how can I say it? Like when you go back home and you look in the media or you look at um, the way things are discussed, too often it's too divisive, too aggressive, too, you know, explosive. Um, what do you think the steps could be done to eradicate that problem? Can I ever go at this one? Um, Thanks, Ben. I, yeah, such a good question. Um, we're working on a campaign at the moment called You Belong Here, um, which is like a toolkit um, to help communities use local stories as a way to talk about belonging in their own words, um, but using the central theme of belonging. And the reason that we're creating it is because um, there are a lot of divisive um, narratives going on in Australia, like the world, um, and we felt it was our role to be more vocal as an organisation and give other people tools to be vocal about taking the power back from the major storytellers right now, which are the news outlets, and putting it in the democratic hands of the people and sharing stories in their own words. So I think the most powerful thing we can do is empower storytellers and story listeners, because story listeners also need empowering and they need um, competencies of how to be a listener and, and how to develop those connecting abilities. And um, yeah, I empowering those stories to so in all these organisations that are represented here, I think elevating those stories that we've heard on the stage, um, all of your stories about why you're here, these are the things that we need to do to cut through the power dynamic at the moment that exists with these major, um, these major storytellers that are, that are taking control of our televisions and our news media and, and things like that. And I'm not saying all media is bad because as Justin helped us workshop today, we can use it for good. Um, but in terms of local, unscripted, democratic stories, um, it can be done on a low budget and it can be done strategically to enhance what you're already doing with your organisation. So I think that's a way that we can speak back to those divisive narratives, um, not by saying you're wrong, but by, just by showing an alternate reality that exists, um, using the stories to drive the connections and the movement. Yes, of course. I, I just, that's a really good question. And, uh, and, and because I'm from the north side of the border, <laughs> we, we, we tend to look at the United States, you know, in the situation that it's in. And, and uh, I guess we see a devaluation of truth that's happening in society. You know, and, uh, you know, it's okay to have a difference of opinion and, and have a different point of view, but as long as it's based on truth. And what we see in the, what's happening in society is that uh, divisive uh, movements are, are, based, are not based on truth. They, they lie, they exaggerate, um, they, they, they diminish uh, uh, other people. And, and I guess the, it, it's this whole breakdown of, of, uh, of not of being able to lie and get away with it and nobody challenging you is, 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 has contributed to that. We, we're talking about Facebook, right? The other day, yesterday, Luis brought it up, and uh, and why is why is uh, face the owner of Facebook not taking down um, uh, 
pages that are at, at, that we know that are, that are, are not tr that are t ex telling lies, you know, and, uh, and 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 then disguising that as freedom of speech. That's not wrong. You know, people have a right to speak, but they sh people shouldn't have a right to lie. You know, I think there's a difference uh, between that. And uh, and uh, society has to change. Society has to shut down. Uh, say shut down. I have no authority to do that. I have no right to do that. But things like Fox News, you know, you, you, you know, it, it deliberately distorting the, the truth to, to meet an end is a sickness that we have in, 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 in open societies today. And that was, has to change. Mm -hmm. we, we actually are going to have one more question mm -hmm. from Eugene Mustafa. What, what do you say to people who think that being in a relationship with a person with a disability means that the partner is going to turn into a nurse? And uh, the question, I have a question about ageism. What would you say to a person who argues that older people uh, should no longer be in the workforce because of declining mental abilities? We'll do the first question first with Matthew. And I think, it's, I think the question was not, not for you specifically, Matthew, but uh, what ha you know, that there, I think you're referring to some, some bias and prejudice out there, yeah? yeah? about if, uh, if you uh, are a person who has a, a disability, is in a relationship, what would you advise to, to someone who was saying, well, that, that person, their partner is going to turn into their, their caregiver? What do you say to that? Yeah, I, I think that's a, a real negative, and I don't think that's really accurate, because I think when you're in a relationship, care goes both ways. Um, and I think there's value to both. And I'm sure in your relationship with Eugene and your sister, I think, you know, you care for your sister as she's cared for you. And I think yeah. in, in, in people with disabilities, they don't always see that. Um, but I think it's really important to understand that both people in a relationship have value and that if we care for each other and we support each other, that's what makes a relationship strong. Um, so I think that's really important yeah. to change that narrative. Yeah. And I hope yeah. that answers your question. That was great. And, and now the second question again, and who's it for? Uh, um, I would say it's for Sophie. Sophie. Uh, yeah. So, um, oh, sorry. Uh, okay. So saying that, <clears throat> uh, actually, it's, all, it's for all, all of you, but because it's uh, about ageism. I was, yeah, wondering. So I've heard some people complain or argue that um, older people should no longer be in the workforce or not work or do anything because of declining mental ability. How would you argue against that? Great question again. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Over to uh, yeah, the Human Rights Commission has made workplace discrimination a really core issue to focus on because older people are um, being unfairly dismissed and there's a lot of lawsuits around that as well because um, it's not necessarily around capability but around just a different set of values or ways of working. But I think with this issue, there's a lack of knowledge transition that new employees are coming in, older people are leaving, and there's this lack of continuity in history. Um, recently, we helped record the stories for St John of God, um, this huge hospital nursing home group in Australia, and we recorded the original nuns that came over from Ireland and their founding stories of how they set it up. And those stories are being used to communicate to staff the values of the company because they've been somewhat lost in the hospital um, space where people don't have time to spend time with their patients but these um, nuns are saying we set it up to because we care about people so it's an example of how we need older people's wisdom in the workplace to drive the right type of business values and we don't get obsessed with efficiency and timeliness and things like that so to your question I think well there are definitely um, things we need to put in place to make sure workplace discrimination is acted on and laws and and look at this as a sort of uh, advocacy agenda. But I also think that there are different types of work and we need to support older people in that transition out of retirement to focus on work in the community. Um, you know, my father-in-law just retired and he has no idea what to do with his life and I've been supporting him to think about other types of work, which is, um, you know, I'm inspired by, by the friendship bench and other ideas because 
yeah, it's just about finding a new purpose and sense of agency. Um, so we both need to change workplace discrimination as well as transform the idea of what work is and what um, involvement in community really means. And, and maybe also uh, change the, the understanding that some people have or misunderstanding that, uh, that you are required to enter or exit the workforce because of your birth date. Uh, we're now going to have a 90 second uh, video uh, that Sophie has brought with us on belonging and this is going to be very interesting to watch but also gives each of the panelists time for the closing question which will be I guess about a sentence because that's what we have. What advice would you give this movement of which you're a part? To build this movement one idea is and You've got about 90 seconds to figure that out. <laughs> okay, can we, uh, can we uh, the get the video? Said no one. We are lonely, isolated, separate. It seems our elders are hidden away, no longer face to face with wisdom. The endless possibilities of learning from each other are diminished by built up walls, forcing us to live without values. Blind efficiency is our greatest untapped resource, and human connection is an optional extra. A Facebook friend request is answered, while our longing for belonging fills every community. Emotion is baggage. Conflict is our true nature. While empathy, they tell me it's 40% lower than it used to be. Apathy to everything, not just what we agree with. To belong, we must learn, we are alone. We are alone. We must learn to belong to everything, not just what we agree with. Apathy, they tell me it's 40% lower than it used to be, while empathy is our true nature. Conflict is baggage. Emotion fills every community. Our longing for belonging is answered while a Facebook friend request is an optional extra. And human connection is our greatest untapped resource. Blind efficiency forcing us to live without values. Built up walls are diminished by the endless possibilities of learning from each other, face to face with wisdom. No longer, it seems, our elders are hidden away. We are lonely, isolated, separate, said no one. The world is connected. Well, the poet herself is right here on the stage. Thanks. It's really hard to write backwards. It's not an amazing <laughs> poem, but it was hard to write backwards. <laughs> it's fantastic. Okay, I'm, I think I'll just do a sweep this way. Um, start with Miss Simbi and your uh, advice to how to build this movement of belonging. Invest in relationship, build your own personal integrity because that's what creates trust and get engaged. Peggy. I would add to that, get engaged as a bridging leader, one who is capable of holding your own self-confidence while you reach out across divides and bring others in. Thank you, Graham. Uh, see the interconnections and strive to work together. Sophie. Flip the narrative, um, like in that poem, and tell stories, record stories, train your community to listen to and share stories to further drive your change. Matthew. I think to create belonging, um, move from inclusion to meaningful inclusion, and um, when you are a leader, um, create other leaders um, to create more change in the world. Right on. Kenneth. In our tradition, we always give thanks to creation, all the birds, the animals, the trees, the medicines, and that we are all, every one of us are part of creation. We understand the role of the animals and the plants. We have to, it's our lifelong duty to find out what our role is in creation and how we belong to creation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.